Progress Wrestling chapters 37 and 38. Here in October of 2016, British Wrestling and Progress Wrestling are heating up, entering a new era. We got a new world champion. We got new tag team champions. We got a new Atlas Championship. What's that? It's a lot of big, tasty motherfuckers fighting for a belt that you have to be 205 or above. And good golly, we're finally letting women wrestle for championships now. They just get everything, don't they? And look, there's only one guy pulling a condom out of his ass on this show, so... If you were, if you were looking for more than that, well, you came to the wrong place. But if you're looking for just some good-natured tomfoolery, well, you've come to the right place. Right here on the Apron Bump Podcast. Yeah. In the heart is, talk around and disregard it. Ship you off the ground, show you what heart is. Standing strong and proud, nothing can knock it. Let's get started. Yeah, back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is up, everybody? Hello. Or wait, or should I say hello there? <laughs> because uh, they're talking about, you know, you know, British wrestling and people over there in Europe. Hey, speaking of which, fresh off the heels off of uh, a great clash at the castle. Uh, I'm recording this before the show, but I can only assume it was a, a hoot and a holler. Um, actually, you know what? No, I'll pretend like I hold on, I'll, I'll cut this out. Uh, future Kyle, cut this out and we'll add this in um, talking about what happened at Clash at the Castle. <clears throat> three, one, two, one, two, three, four. Yeah, Clash at the Castle. Can't believe Noam Dar came out and won all the belts. That was fucking crazy. I didn't see that happening at all. Local Scotland guy, but you know, really, they really kind of went into their bag. They were so in their bag, WWE was. Cut it. Yeah, that's good. Good, good take. Um,. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, you look, you guys are already in the European mode. You got your, uh, you got your broomsticks. You got your golden snatches snatch. Is it golden snatch or golden snitch? <laughs> I feel like it's probably golden snitch. And I, uh, just set a porn category instead. Golden snitch. It is the golden snitch. You know what? For the sake of this podcast, it's the Golden Snatch. That's really what this podcast is. Like, I'm the Golden Snatch and you're trying to grab me. Uh, what? Anyways, we got Progress Wrestling here. But, I mean, but, but what I was saying is, look, you already, you know, you just watched the whole wrestling show with all the chants. You got all, you know, you got your beans and toasts. You got your, uh, well, I guess it's just a, is that just a London thing? Or is that? All of Europe, beans and toast. What is the real question here is what is Scottish cuisine? I guess is really the answer. It's really the question we got to be asking here. So let me pull this. You know, I can go ahead and share my screen even. Close that tab. All right. Uh, Scottish food. Kind of haggis. That's right. What the fuck? What is haggis? This is, is when I do these shows by myself, I have nobody asked to ask these questions to. Let's but we're, we're here researching. Look, you're, 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 you're hopping in here. You're researching with me. We're all learning. Let's go through some of these Scottish foods. Scotch pie. Why do all these things sound awful? Scottish pie, a meat pie. I'll show you a meat pie. Oh, yeah. Scottish porridge. Colin skink. These are made up words. What is a Cullen skink? Oh, it's a fish soup. Mmm, yum. Um, not gonna join your email list. Don't want to look at this ever again. Look at haggis. What is haggis? Sausage meat made from the innards of sheep mixed with onions, oatmeal, suet, stock, dried herbs, and other seasonings. These ingredients are combined and then boiled inside the lining of a sheep's stomach. This just gets worse and worse with every syllable. What the fuck are you guys doing over there? Do I have any Scots listening? If so, turn this shit off. I don't want your support at all. Neeps and tatties. <laughs> fucking, 
<laughs> this list is psychotic. I don't know what you guys are doing, what you guys are doing over there, but golly, I hope you have a McDonald's or something. Jesus Christ. Um, but anyways, point being is that you're all revved up for some European wrestling. So let me let me pile on to your uh, to your appetite. Um, hopefully not full of haggis. We got progress wrestling here. Like I said, uh, October of 2016, we got two shows. I'll pull these shows up here. By the way, if you're watching on the YouTube version, I got a whole, you know, little. Little visual aids. I don't have visual aids, but I have visual aids on the on the uh, YouTube here showing what kind of she is we're going to be talking about today. Um, but I'm pulling up the cards here. We got chapter 37 here. Happening from Manchester, England on October 16th, 2016. And then we got chapter 38 coming at you from London, England and the electric ballroom occurring on October 30th, 2016. So about two weeks in between these shows, I'll reference night one and night two back and forth throughout this episode. The first episodes, chapter 37, second show is chapter 38. I got the cards up here. I'll probably throw the cards in the description as well in case you're interested. Um, but it was a good old time, man. We got some progress wrestling here. Coming off of their uh, biggest show that they've had to date in uh, Brixton and the O2 Academy. Um, it was like 2,000 people, I believe. Maybe 2,400, somewhere in there. But it was by far their biggest show they've ever done. And it was kind of like their... Uh, like a season finale of sorts, you know, I didn't really feel like it in the moment as I was watching chapter 36, but after watching chapter 37 and chapter 38, it's clear that we're entering a new, uh, not a new chapter, a new volume, I guess, of progress. And I've had people come on here that kind of have referenced that progress kind of treats certain eras like they'll like bundle certain chapters and that'll be like a volume. You know, like chapters. And by the way, if you want to relive all of these volumes in full, I've covered every single chapter up to this point. Chapter one, all the way through here, through almost chapter 40, through chapter 38. Go to apronbump.com or I'll put the link in the description as well if you want to filter to all of my episodes that I've covered chronologically of Progress Wrestling. And uh, I'm watching this in real time. So even if you're like, hey, I don't know anything about Progress. Well, hey, guess what, guy or gal? I'm watching this and living through it in real time, basically. So we're going to learn together is what we're doing here. I'm no expert on British wrestling. I just enjoy I, I enjoy a fair bit of graps over there across the pond. And we're kind of just walking through it. So go binge away. It's a good old time. It's always good talking about progress. But like I was saying, I've had guests who are more uh, in tune, who are more knowledgeable about progress wrestling in their history up to current days. And there's certain chapters that are bundled like like chapters like one through ten are like the introductory uh, chapters kind of getting accustomed to progress and the characters. We're figuring out who's going to stick around and who isn't. Chapters 10 through 20 is like the Jimmy Havoc era where he's reigning. We're seeing crazy storylines. He's threatening to decapitate people. And then chapters 20, like pretty much up until 36 is kind of like kind of finding like progress is becoming a big deal. We're getting big stars that are coming over. We're kind of pushing with new talent like Will Ospreay, Mark Haskins rise, uh, Marty Skrull, who's like dominating the European scene at this point. And I mean, I'm walked by the way. In in parallel with progress, I've talked about this before. I don't I don't, you know, podcast about it, but I'm also watching like OTT up in Ireland. I'm watching uh, a little bit of WXW from Germany. I'm watching Rev Pro and so I'm kind of seeing the entire picture of British wrestling at this point, and it is we're gearing up for a red hot era. We're already kind of in it. I mean, companies are kind of sprouting up and gaining popularity, working with with the WWE. So for context, at this point in the timeline, this is when the this is right after the Cruiserweight Classic in which a few guys, a few regulars from Progress were uh, participants in, you know, Zack Sabre Jr., Noam Dar. Uh, Fabian Eichner, I believe, was he in it? I believe he was, who, you know, spoiler alert, maybe makes a debut here. But yeah, it's just a fun era of British wrestling. And it's a fun time to watch these shows. And basically my point also, all that to say is that we're kind of entering a new era here. 
what does that mean? I know there's a lot of talks in current day wrestling. It's, oh, it's a new era. It's the Paul Levesque era, which is fucking awful. But that's a different podcast in, its, in itself. But for progress here, we're making some changes here, it feels like. First of all, we've established the Atlas Championship, which we'll talk a lot about here, um, which I said in the cold open, but that's the 205 pounds and up championship belt so it's the quote-unquote big lads championship or the quote-unquote big tasty fuckers belt which is what i prefer to call it so uh so we got the atlas championship we got the women's championship which a tournament starts this month which we'll start talking about um but it's the natural progression series but it's the first one with women so it's a single elimination tournament and the winner of the tournament becomes the first ever progress women's champion We also got the tag team belts or the tag team shields. Still got those dumbass shields that they're carrying around. Um, We got new champions that were crowned at the last chapter. British strong style, not new catch Republic. (laughs) British strong style, the team of Pete Dunn and Trent seven. So that's created a whole that that injected a lot of life into a tag division that up to this point, you know, their first four years or so of progress. The tag division, in my opinion, is one area where I feel like they've been kind of weaker, like not necessarily like the performances in the ring, but from a macro perspective, like looking at the roster and maybe it's just the nature of what independent wrestling is, who you can bring in, who can, you know, commit to things. But there haven't been a lot of teams vying for the tag team titles. Like, it felt like the Origin and FSU were fighting for these belts for fucking two years straight. And you have the little Sumerian Death Squad come in as Tommy End and Michael Dante. There's been like only like three and the London riots, of course, have been a staple of the tag division. So like three or four teams just kind of, you know, move this puzzle piece here, move this here, switch this around. And it feels like it kind of got stagnant for a bit. But here... In this, in these two chapters that we're going to talk about, we're introduced. We're introducing uh, new teams. We're solidifying teams that have been introduced, but we're really, like I said, just solidifying them. You know, giving them big wins. And by the end of this month, we got a lot of teams that could be competing for the tag team titles. And uh, we also see the champions in a very interesting situation as well as singles guys. But we'll talk more about that. Just kind of laying the scene here for what we're talking about, but. Um, yeah, basically what I'm saying. So it's a new era. We got new titles, the tag team divisions heating up Atlas championships. New, we got the new women's championship coming up and we got a new world champion and Mark Haskins, who was the winner of the main event at Brixton, uh, defeating Tommy end and Marty Skrull in a triple threat match in the main event. So we got him defending his title this month. And by the end of this month, he is in a very interesting place. He being Mark Haskins, the very weird, (laughs) weird conclusion to chapter 38 night two, Um, which again, well, uh, I'm just I'm just teasing you a little bit, a little foreplay, never hurt anybody. But that's basically what we're going to be talking about today, as, as well as a few other things. But but the real the real glaring thing that I noted from watching these two shows is that there was a lot of debuts again, a new era. Let's introduce some new faces. Some faces that you recognize, probably, you know, especially if you watched Clash at the Castle, we got one lass. And that which brings us to the newest segment on the apron bump called New Faces. New Faces, New Faces. Here are some people that haven't been previously on these shows that we're talking about for the first time. New Faces, New Faces. I haven't seen these people on this particular timeline before, but now they're here now. So they're new. That's what new means. New faces. All right. Spent a lot of money on that jingle. So hope you enjoyed it. Yes, we got some debuts here. Let's just talk about them. Why don't we? Because that's what a podcast is. Uh, So night one, we have two debuts. We got Kaylee Ray versus Kimber Lee. Uh, Kimber Lee. What what happened? Didn't, Didn't something happen with Kimber Lee? Did she get in trouble maybe or injured let's see let's do a little uh, research ski because kimberly she was in one of the may young classics i think her wwe name was abby lath i believe yeah that's what it is 
Um, wrestled in the latest here. She wrestled. She was wrestling in Impact up until 2022. Oh, she retired. Wow, she's just retired about a year ago, May of 2023. Oh, got a little DUI, a little okay. So yeah, there's some hairy business going there, but yeah. So she's <laughs> she's at the time of recording, she's not around. But Kaylee Ray, you may know her better as Albert Albert Alba Fire, who just competed at Clash at the Castle. Again, I'm recording this uh, before the fact. So she very well might be a WWE champion at this point. And here she is making her debut in progress wrestling. So both ladies were kind of not unknowns coming into this, but in progress, obviously they were unknown because uh, that's what a debut is. Uh, they're coming here for the first time. The crowd's kind of just, you know, respecting both of them. It's an awesome match, by the way. I, I'll, there haven't been a ton of women's matches um, in the history of progress up to this point. I will put this match maybe at the top, definitely top three. I will say it was just I mean, these these gals went in there. They knew they had to make a statement and they certainly did. But we also got some character work to close this out. So, I mean, you got Kimberly, who is very suplex heavy. I mean, she must have hit Kaylee Ray with like eight or nine German suplexes and power bombs throughout this match. She got Kaylee Ray using a lot of submission based offense with some high flying Fun chain wrestling. They trade suicide dives, which, by the way, if you wanted to play a drinking game, take a drink every time somebody does a fucking suicide dive <laughs> throughout these two shows. I mean, it was just getting nonsensical at a certain point. But ultimately, in this match, they start throwing bombs at each other. Kimber hits Kaylee with six German suplexes in a row. But Kaylee Ray counters the seventh, hits the KLR bomb, which is like a gory bomb for a two count. Um, Kimberly fights back, goes to the top rope. Kaylee Ray sweeps her feet from under her from the top rope. So Kimber like falls backwards and her neck snaps on the top turnbuckle. Looks brutal. The ref's checking her out. She's like waving uh, uh, Kaylee Ray off. Like, hold on a second there, lass. Is what I think he said. Uh, cool your tits, I think is what the referee said. I'm quoting. That's a quote. Um, so Kaylee's, you know, cause Kimber is there, her neck might be injured. It's a very serious situation, but then Kaylee Ray, that dastardly, the Scott Scottish haggis gets in there and locks in a guillotine <laughs> on the Kimberly Ray, Ray, ranks racks. What, what's the verb I'm looking for? wrenches i don't know right wrenches the injured neck of kimberly she taps out and kaylee ray gets the win in her debut match but it also more importantly solidifies her as you know this dastardly heel it solidifies her ruthlessness and uh we got a new player in the women's division i'm not sure if she's going to be in this inaugural tournament for the women's title, but she made an impression here and as did Kimber. So um, I thought this was a great success. Great success. So it was good stuff there. Hey, you want to talk about some more debuts? I know that's what you were saying. I hear you. I know you're yelling at your radio or your phone. Hardest part of the ring. Give me some more debuts, please. Well, I got you, Tim. Um, we got another singles match on night one. James Drake. Versus Fabian Eichner. You might know Fabian Eichner as Giovanni Vinci from Imperium or formerly from Imperium. Um, what's he doing nowadays, by the way? He got fucking injured by Ludwig Kaiser and he just fuck off. Is he hanging out with Odyssey Jones somewhere? Uh, <laughs> but we got the debut of Fabian Eichner here versus James Drake. Uh, or you might know him as grizzled young veteran hair you know zach gibson is gyv bald james drake is jyv hair um so it was interesting to see because i've seen we've seen a lot of zach gibson up to this point i'm not sure when they start tagging but gibson has uh, i mean hell he's main eventing the first night for the world title so he's obviously established himself james drake I mean, I haven't really seen much of him without 
Zach Gibson. Like, that's pretty much all I know him as is Zach's partner. And I mean, he's a great talent. I've just I've only seen him in a tag team capacity, really. So it's interesting to see him kind of branching out or, you know, not branching out, but on his own here. He comes out, he looks like. I mean, he looks kind of the same as he does now. The long hair, the, the gr gruff, the uh, scuff, you know, beard kind of action. Uh, he's even got the same tights, <laughs> but it seems like he's got his face on his ass, which prompts a lot of ass face chants from the progress crowd. But he also he has his like hair in front of his face when he comes out. He's got like a denim sleeveless vest. It reminds me of uh, Biker Crush. If you guys are familiar, you know, new generation fans out there when Crush was a biker and he had like the crazy piercings and stuff and he had like the wet hair in front of his or or the fake Undertaker. You know, there's a lot of wet hair in front of your face. Very, very emo boy. Like that's what kind of what James Drake is bringing with him here. Um, but another good match. I mean, Eichner was definitely the standout as far as the in-ring stuff. He was just kind of like a white meat baby face kind of guy, but goddamn pal. Like, he's a pretty jack dude. I mean, he looks pretty much the same here as he does now. So if you know what he looks like now, um, that's what you're getting. But I mean, these springboard um, moonsaults, like he'll get in the corner, he'll springboard to the top rope. He'll jump from that rope to the adjacent rope and then do a moonsault. I mean, this guy's also fresh off of the clu cruiser late cruiser weight classic which he looks like this he looks like he's 250 pounds but he wrestles like a cruiserweight which is incredible at some point eichner hits drake with a murderous <laughs> power bomb goes to the top rope it's goes for the frog splash james drake gets out of the way and drake hits him with a uh it's like a mix between a ddt and an x factor you know, it's like an impaler DDT, but he kind of throws him in the middle of his legs. I don't know. It was interesting, but that gives James Drake the win, which I was pretty surprised about. But um, you know, Drake looked good, but I think Eichner came out the star in this match. I'd be I'd be surprised if he didn't show back up soon after this. But um, I guess they probably bring him over to WWE kind of soon. So maybe not. I don't know. But. Good stuff there. James Drake, Fabian Iker, two more debuts. And I would say another successful uh, debut match. You know, no, no crazy stakes involved, but it was cool just seeing two new characters here. So we got a women. We got we got a pair of women's debuts. We got a pair of men's debuts. How about a debut of a pair? Huh? The tag team. We got a tag team <laughs> debut. Uh, we got the Hunter brothers who ha have appeared. In progress before it's been a little bit i feel like uh jim hunter and lee hunter versus the new nation the team of alexander henry and jason prime <laughs> so the new nation so when i saw this on the card because i looked at the card you know before watching the show i was interested and i see the new nation because I didn't recognize the names of Alexander Henry or Jason Prime. I see the new nation. I'm like, oh, they're they're making fun of, you know, however, like on WWE or whatever, whenever there's like multiple black people in a group, everyone on the Internet's like, oh, it's the new nation of domination. Like when the Hurt Business got together, it's like, oh, man, we got the new nation of domination or when the new day first got together. You know what I'm saying, right? So I thought this was like a spoof on that. Like, I thought this was, a, was like a satire on that mindset. So I thought it was gonna be like two black guys coming out there. <laughs> like, yeah, we're the new nation because we're, you know, I mean, you, you get you get what I'm saying. So I thought it was gonna be funny. But a, boy, howdy, was this the opposite of two black guys? <laughs> it was two ginger fucks. So we got Alexander Henry, who's just. How do I visually describe him? It's kind of a normal ginger. Think of like a ginger, but like pretty muscular. That's pretty much what it is. And then we got <laughs> Jason Prime. You may, you, if you were uh, an NXT UK watcher, you know him as Primate. So he's like the stout, jacked, bald fellow with the huge beard. So we got Primate debuting. And I guess he's in a team with Alexander Henry. Uh, I thought they looked good. You know, I look, it was a very... So we got two teams because the hunters haven't been there in a while so 
for all intents and purposes, we got two new teams injected into this tag division, which, as I was talking about earlier, kind of desperately needs it. And uh, honestly, I didn't really have many expectations on this match, but when it got going, I was into it, man. Uh, the Hunters, they're kind of like. So I see them, I'm like, oh, it's kind of like the Young Bucks, but but they kind of just look a little cunty. I like, I don't, I don't know. It's just something about their face. It's like they're they're uh, I don't know. And they've like beefed up a little bit since they debuted because they used to be a very, you know, Young Bucks style, very high flying you know, two brothers that are kind of indistinguishable from each other, which, by the way, let me talk about that for a second. The Hunter brothers, Lee Hunter, Jim Hunter, they come out with the same tights, the same boots, the same hair. Everything's the same on the back of their tights on their ass. It says Hunter, you know, both of them have Hunter on their ass. Like, motherfucker, I, I, I know you. I know you're both hunters. Put your first name on your tights. Like, they're not doing twin magic or anything. You don't need to hide the fact of who you are, Jim or Lee. Jim, put Jim on your ass. Lee, put Lee on your ass. So that we know. So that the commentators know. So the fans know. So we... I, I want to know which ass switch is what I'm saying. Okay? <clears throat> Anyways, that was my one gripe. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> Fun match. It was interesting to see the evolution of the Hunter brothers incorporating more. Um, they're less high fly at this point, but still maintain. Like there's one point where I think it was Jim Hunter does like a he springs to the top rope from the ground, hits a moonsault in the ring, got crazy height on it. Um, just a good tag team. My thing here, it's cool to see two teams. You know, you don't see a lot of teams anymore you see two you see a lot of pairs of singles guys the fucking look at wwe as of again i'm recording this before smackdown and clash at the castle as of right now both teams in wwe are just two singles guys put together like i know awesome truth they have history and at this point both got both teams are kind of teams but initially they were kind of they're kind of just two individuals put together who the hell are the tag team champions in AEW? Are the Young Bucks? Yeah, the Young Bucks are the champions. Yeah, so, but point is, you don't see a lot of teams anymore. These guys felt like teams. I think that's something that needs to come back and, and be more prevalent in modern day wrestling, but some fun double teams between the two guys. You got uh, the New Nation. They do like a German suplex, European uppercut combo, drop kick into a, uh, so they do the German European uppercut. One guy has one hunter pinned and then the other hunter leaps off the top rope hits a missile drop kick onto the guy that's not pinning him and then hits a senton on the way down to break up the pin i don't know if that makes sense with words <laughs> but i was watching it i was like that's pretty impressive it's great timing um primate 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 hits a double suplex on the hunters and kind of holds him up there for a little bit it was very look, like i said he's like probably like a five nine dude but he is He's wider than he is tall. I mean, he's a jacked motherfucker. And it's a double suplex on the Hunters. Uh, Alexander Henry does a moonsault to the outside. One of the, it was a CM Punk moonsault. Like, it was a crooked moonsault. But uh, hits it, looked devastating in the ring. Primate goes to attack one of the Hunters in the corner. The Hunter gets out of the way. Primate shoulders the ring post, and then the Hunter... Rolls him up for the win. So the Hunter brothers get the quick win out of nowhere. Um, so they get the win. But the nation looked good in their debut. Like, like I said, I didn't really have much expectations, but I was happy with this. That was the opening match of night two. It was a good way to start off the show. So um, is that new faces? We got one more new face, which we'll talk about uh, in a second here. But he is involved in the Atlas championship which we'll get into here so rampage brown became the first ever atlas champion at chapter 36 defeating joe coffee and in both chapters here 37 and 38 he is issuing open challenges so spoiler alert he wins on the first night and defends on the second night as well we'll just touch on the first night real quick because i didn't really have much to say but I, actually i did so the first night rampage comes out Issues an open challenge for the Atlas Championship, like a 
remember, is two of five and up. Who answers the challenge? Yoko Zoon. No, it's Mikey Whiplash comes out, who if you're unfamiliar with him or as a reminder, in case you forget, Mikey Whiplash is the guy who comes out with like a helmet with horns on it. He has thigh high fishnets deals going on. Uh, the face paint underneath the helmet. He's a very bizarre looking dude. And but he comes out here. I was pretty pissed because he had no fishnets here. Like, that's his whole thing. Like when he comes out, like Mikey Whiplash comes out, you're like, do I want to boo this guy or do I want to fuck this guy? Like, that's that's what we all think when he comes out. Right. He's supposed to confuse our sexuality. That's that's the point. Right. Um, but he comes out. No, no fishnets. And I'm like, I'm just straight today, I guess. So. But apparently and I didn't really gather this, honestly. Um, he comes out, by the way, my wife sat with, he, she, she didn't watch all these matches with me, but she happened to be sitting next to me during this match. And she looks at Mikey Whiplash and jokingly, she was like, oh, is that, is that Malachi Black? But apparently, according to commentary, Mikey Whiplash is, uh, referencing Malachi or Tommy End as he's known here. He's kind of supposed to be dressed like Tommy N, like just the plain black tights, the black kick pads, no fishnets, which, again, I wouldn't have gathered this had commentary not said it because he kind of looks pretty similar to what he usually looks like. But he comes out. He also does like the crisscross applesauce pose on the stage. So I guess that's his way of Mikey Whiplash and Tommy N, I guess, are still feuding. Uh, we touched on that in the last few chapters. There was no Tommy N this month, so... That was pretty much the extent of it here. But, but it was just funny that my wife called this out without knowing that. So I guess it I guess she recognized the resemblance, but I never would have. Um, so, yeah, the first ever defense of this Atlas championship, Rampage Brown versus Mikey Whiplash. Rampage ends up winning with a brutal pile driver. I mean, all of his pile drivers are brutal. This one, he like. I think Mikey came off the second rope for like a missile drop kick. Rampage catches him yanks him up from the ground and then pile drives him back down, which looked gnarly. Uh, but that gives him the win. It was an OK match. You know, it's nothing new. Uh, my nipples weren't completely turgid. My left one might have been might have been a prairie dog in a bit, um, but it didn't get me full, um, full, tur not full turgidity on this one, but it was OK. It was a good way. To, but look, we're solidifying. We're trying to build up this prestige of this Atlas championship rampage. In my opinion, is a great first champion. He's like a pretty much a progress original crowd loves him. He's just a bit. He, he wrestles like a big guy should wrestle. Like he's not doing these crazy intricate flips. Like he does have athleticism about him, but he just hits you really hard. He power bombs. you, He lariats. you, He cuddles you to sleep and then he pile drives you and then wins matches. So that's what rampage did uh, in night one. Night two, just continuing talking about the Atlas Championship to wrap that up. A, another open challenge he's issuing on night two. Who answers this one? Bad Bones, John Klinger. Uh, if you're unfamiliar, uh, first of all, unfortunately, you might be unfortunately just familiar for this reason. Um, within the past couple weeks or so, he did pass away. Uh, bad bones. I think it was a heart attack. I believe um, I could be wrong. Don't take that as <laughs> gospel, but uh, it's very sad. Very sad. He was only like in his he was in his 40s, I think. Um, but he was a stalwart. He was a staple of the German wrestling scene. Look, I'm not no, I'm not a bad bones expert by any means, but I have watched a good bit of WXW from like the mid 2010s to late, you know, to where we're at here. And John Klinger is always in the picture. He's you know, a world champion. He's in the world champion scene. He's a multiple time WXW champion, 16 karat gold winner. Like he was their guy over there and he's making his debut here in progress. But it was it was it was nice to see him here because, like I mentioned, you know, recently losing him. It was very sad, unfortunately. And if you're, if you're unfamiliar with Bad Bones, I, I would definitely recommend finding some matches. He's had some great matches with Gunther over there um i mean even this match with rampage brown i think this was definitely the stronger atlas title match uh from this month so it was cool to see bad bones here 
Um, aesthetically, look, if you're you know, unfamiliar, he's bald, he's jacked, he has tattoos. He's like, <clears throat> picture, pic, picture a jacked guy on a motorcycle. That's John Klinger. <laughs> He's got the goatee. My, 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 he might have had like handlebar mustache here. I forget, but um, he's he's out there in like jeans. Like he's just a rough, rough and tough guy. But he's very, very because you look at him, you think, oh, it's this brawling asshole. We got we got a uh, you know like a uh, who's just like a big brawler, like Crush. Let's just bring up Crush again because we were talking about him earlier, like a Crush or like a. Waylon Mercy, like just a bumbling, you know, let me hit you, whatever the hell. But Bad Bones has a lot more to him. And I really enjoyed this match because this is what big man wrestling should be. I feel like, you know, I saw somebody post something on Twitter. That I re that really resonated with me. Um, let me see if I can even find it. I retweeted it recently. Shout out uh, at Dom Billington on Twitter or X. Um, it's a clip of Oba Femi throwing bodies around on NXT and he, he retweeted it or he quote tweeted it and said, I'm so glad there's a big dude who isn't doing handsprings and head scissors at a quarter speed, which is like, God damn it. Thank you. Thank you. It is such like the athletic big man. Like, look, it's impressive, right? I'm not going to diminish the the uh, the talent that it takes to be that size and to also incorporate that level of athleticism in your wrestling offense. Like, it's very impressive, right? Your Keith Lee's, your um, die jacks, Josh Briggs, you know, even you harken back to like Vader and Bam Bam. But like. Here in 2024, that style is such a dime a dozen, in my opinion. Again, it's impressive. Don't want to diminish that. But as a wrestling fan, there's just too much of it. You know, 300 pound guys doing tope suicidas and jumping off the top rope and doing moonsaults. Like there was a point in time where it was like, holy shit, did that just happen? Like when Vader did a moonsault, you like were watching it and you're like, this isn't physically possible. Like that's not going to happen. Then he does it and it just blows your mind right out of your rectum. Bam, bam, Bigelow, same thing, you know? But they they incorporated those high flying moves when it called for it only sparingly and in big moments that called for it, not just on a, you know, who gives a fuck rampage match. And I say all of that because this match here, rampage, rampage, um, speaking of rampage, uh, rampage Brown versus bad bones. This is what a big, tasty fucker match should be. This is what an Atlas championship match should be, in my opinion. Two big, beefy blokes just running into each other very hard. Lots of lariats in this match. Some really sickening lariats. Um, you know, an occasional maybe second rope drop kick or, you know, bad bones whips out like a, like a, a slingshot spear through the rope. So there's like fun elements embedded in this kind of brawl. But it's it's utilized to an extent to where like when he when he breaks out that slingshot spear, it's like, oh, shit, where did that come from? It was just paced very well. And um, it was just a fun match. You know, it's we don't need big men flying around all over the place th for the entire thing. We don't need them being ultra technical. Just hit each other really hard until one guy doesn't get up anymore. And that's what this match was. Uh, but Rampage eventually wins. He hits like a, a back suplex off the top rope, follows it right up with a pile driver and gets the win. So Rampage again successfully defends the Atlas Championship. So again, we're just building that prestige. We're establishing the foundation of what this division is. And I'm enjoying it so far. I'm enjoying it so far. That's what that's what progress. That's a thing that progress does very well. Throughout the entire card, you know, like, for example, look at this. This is so this was night two. Right. And we'll talk more about some of these matches. Here, here's like the sequential order of some of these matches. We had a tag team tables match. Then we have this big tasty fuckers match. Then we have two cruiserweights wrestling in a high flying match. 
Then we have the main event, which is a triple threat match. So you have, you know, plunder. You have big men. You have high flyers. You have main event spectacle. Like, you have these different things. It's like a buffet of stuff. And that's what a wrestling card should be, in my opinion. That's why it always drives me crazy when it's like, these discussions happen online of like, what is quote unquote real wrestling? It's like, first of all, there's no answer to that. It's all subjective. Like, there's no, there's no such thing as real wrestling. Pro wrestling is scripted. I don't know if you guys knew that. Uh, but wrestling, to me, what my answer to that question, what is, what is, what should wrestling be? What should wrestling be? It's not like you can't answer that with like a singular match. You can't say, oh, wrestling should be technical. Or, oh, wrestling should be a soap opera spectacle. No, I want a wrestling show. You got to look at it in terms of a show. You know, groups of matches. I want a wrestling show to be a little bit of everything. That's why WrestleMania 17, in my opinion, is the best pay-per-view to ever happen. Because you have technical matches, you have plunder, you have soap opera, you have spectacle. And that's what progress has given us here. Not to compare this show to (laughs) WrestleMania 17, but. um, So good stuff there. Good stuff. Loving the Atlas title so far. Um, Speaking of championships, why don't we talk about the tag team division, which was a main. It was a focal point. Definitely this month. Like I said in the outset, like. Is a division that's been kind of shallow up to this point, but with, you know, the like we talked about earlier, the debut of the new nation, bringing back the Hunter brothers and. We got some other stuff that we're going to talk about, but just injecting life into this division. And I'll say the champions, by the way, Pete Dunn, Trent Seven, do not defend the titles this month, but they are both in a four way on night one, uh, which we'll talk about later. But just talking about the tag team, like tag team matches and the tag team division. Let's start off by talking about night one, the progress tag team title, number one contendership, triple threat match we got the team of fsu which is comprised of eddie dennis and mark andrews versus the south pacific power trip the team of tk cooper and travis banks versus the origin dave mastiff and el Ligero represented here so three teams two girls one cup we got a triple threat match here to Decide who the number one contender is going to be for the progress shields. First things first. We got to talk about the king of banter style. Or the Bantasaurus Rex, as he calls himself. Dave Mastiff. So him and the him and Laguero, which look. If you're if you're if you've listened to this podcast, you listen to me talk about progress. You know, one thing if you know nothing else. You know, daddy is a big origin mark. I mean, this faction is just. <laughs> this is stupid. It's so stupid. Laguero comes out with his stupid horns and his stupid cape, which he always comes out with. Right. That's his deal. Dave Mastiff, and I guess I guess in an effort of solidarity, also has a cape on, which has Laguero's face on it. So he just borrowed one of Laguero's capes. He also has a beer helmet. Which, you know, the fucking king of the hill, he has beers, beers on his helmet and the tube, the drink, you know, the thing, right? What never happened to those, by the way? I feel like those were so big in the 90s and then it just kind of fell off. Uh, or maybe I'm just not in the right circle of friends. But <laughs> Dave Mastiff comes out in a cape and a beer helmet. Um, in the ring introductions, Jim Smallman reminds us that Dave Mastiff, he's big. He's bad. Ask your mom. He's probably your dad. And uh, Laguero gets this hilariously long intro as well. Saying that this is his fourth match of the day. And if they win, they'll go wrestle two more tonight. And then they're going to go to other planets and wrestle and then become the real universal champion. It's a whole thing. It's a whole thing. And Dave Mastiff, you know, they pose in the middle of the ring. Laguero's on his hands and knees and Mastiff is over him. And he's revving his horns like a motorcycle. It's very silly, but I like it. I love it, actually. They, uh, by the way, I know I know you're desperately asking. You're like yelling at me. You're like hardest part of the ring. What beers were in the beer helmet? Well, I'll tell you, folks. There were Foster's, which I believe is an, an Australian beer. 
Dave Mastiff offers these fosters to the South Pacific power trip, TK Cooper and Travis Banks. But they are New Zealand, not Australian, which I guess are different things. Um, <laughs> so they're, that, I guess that's offensive. I guess it's offensive to hand a New Zealander a uh, Fosters. That's a fun fact. So I'll try to avoid that in the future. But so that happens. It's a very banter heavy match. It's it's, it's a triple threat. It's fucking six guys and they're doing a bunch of shit. It's a lot. There's a lot going on. Eddie Dennis body slams everybody. He even hits a very impressive body slam to Dave Mastiff, who is a, a big boy. A lot of stone. That Dave Mastiff. Why are you guys? Why are we still measuring people in stone? By the, I don't. I'm not going to get on that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no. Eddie body slams Dave Mastiff, which prompts commentary to make this sound. Flow over by Eddie Dennis. Oh. 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 oh my god! So it's it's just a lot of chaos. We have a uh, not a double down, but we have a uh, what was it? A sex tuple down. All six guys, you know, they're taking turns, hitting their big moves at some point, and everybody's down. Dahlia Black, who is the uh, the girlfriend or wife of, I think it's like just girlfriend at this point, of uh, TK Cooper of the South Pacific Power Trip. Dahlia gets on the apron, and TK goes for a big boot onto somebody, but they get out of the way, and TK accidentally kicks the shit out of his girlfriend, knocks her off the apron. And uh, then receives a next stomp driver from FSU. But Laguero breaks up the pin. So we got some fun false finishes in this match, even though it's very heavy on the uh, silliness. But uh, ultimately, Travis Banks locks in a crazy looking UFO on Mark Andrews, which is you may have seen Cesaro do that to Seth Rollins at that WrestleMania. It's an airplane spin, but it's, you know, backwards and then you don't use your hands. It's it was I, I I'll probably throw a clip on this of this somewhere because it was very impressive looking and the way he slammed him on the mat after all this spins. It just looked devastating. And that gives the win to Travis Banks, to TK Cooper, the South Pacific power trip. So this is a tag team that has already been established for a bit in progress, but they haven't really had a big win yet. And I feel like this was their big coming out party here. And uh, they are now the number one contenders for the tag team titles, which is very interesting. We've got a heel team who's going to challenge another heel team, but I guess we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. But yeah, just a fun match. You yeah, a pretty surprising winner because, you know, like, like FSU and the origin, the other two teams here are like the two teams that have been a constant fixture in the, Tag team title scene. So it was nice to see something different here. And uh, yeah, the tag team title scene just feels fresh for the first time in a couple of years at this point. So good stuff there. Um, and while we're just, you know what? We're talking about these New Zealand cunts. Let's just uh, let's stay on the topic here with night two. So that match we just talked about was night one. Night two, it's not about titles anymore. It's about revenge. So the team of so the South Pacific Power Trip have been feuding with the team of Jack Sexsmith and Roy Johnson, or I guess their team name is the Shirtlifters, which. All right, that's that's what we're doing. It's a tables match. Tables match. So, again, if you're unfamiliar with Jack, Sex, Jack Sexsmith and Roy Johnson, Roy Johnson is like a big jacked up John Cena comes out there. He raps. He has a lot of rap battles. He's like a power lifter guy. Very simple offense, but he's 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 his foundation is charisma, I guess, from from what I've seen from him. Uh, Jack Sexsmith, another kind of comedy act. He, he has a Mr. Mr. Kako. He pulls out of his tights. It's a condom. It's the whole thing. He, he has a gimp that comes out with him sometimes. He comes out to I Touch Myself by the Divinals. Uh, what do they call him? Sexually frivolous, morally ambiguous, or might it be the other way around? I don't know. But they're basically two guys that are always there for levity. But the thing here is that these two guys have been screwed over by the South Pacific power trip for too long. Yeah, there's a little video package before the match. Jack Sexsmith is like, Look, we're going to we're going to prove that we're more than just comedy relief. No more fun and games, he says. 
he also says that the foreplay is done for. So, um, but they come out, they're a little less flamboyant, less dancing, less crowd interaction. They both are in the center of the ring waiting for the power trip to come out. But those goddamn South Pacific guys in their Pearl Harbor jobs. <laughs> uh, I should cut that out, but I'm not going to. They attack from behind. You know, their entrance music, their entrance music plays. Dahlia comes out uh, to distract the shirt lifters, the power trip. They attack from behind. So it's a double. It's a tables match. So you, you win by putting both of your opponents through a table. Um, we've been talking a lot of tables matches recently, I feel like. So I guess the common theme is that, you know, if you get put through a table, you're not eliminated from the match. Like you don't have to leave the match. But you have to both be put through a table to lose the match is the thing, I guess. I don't know. So I'm watching this. And I, like, it's a common thing watching 2016 progress. There's so many guys I watch. I'm like, man, I wish I just wish I just wish you weren't such a knobhead in your personal life because there's some talented dudes here. Travis Banks is so fun to watch. He, he comes out red hot at the low, low pay. He's kicking people. He has that like Muay Thai kind of style to him. He does one toe pay through the ropes, but Jack Sexsmith hits him with a chair. Who's also a fucking cunt, apparently, but. <laughs> You know, we're watching it for the wrestling. We're watching it. We're compartmentalizing here. But yeah, it was, look, it's it's plunder. It's silliness. You know, when there's a tables, when there is a match in London and you're relying on furniture, there's always a little bit of like. Is it going to cooperate? Are these tables going to are these working tables or are these shoot tables? You know what I'm saying? Are these uh is it are, are these table are these tables gonna throw out uh it doesn't work for me, brother? You know what I'm saying? Cause <laughs> ladders break and tables don't break and chairs are it's it's always a mess. But the tables for the most part uh did their job here. Uh the eliminations start coming. We got uh bro, well, first of all, Dahlia Black once again gets on the apron to try to distract. TK's opponents, TK Cooper, her boyfriend, goes for a right hand onto Roy Johnson, but Roy gets out of the way and TK punches the shit out of death. So he's just abusing Dahlia here this month um, inadvertently, but knocks her off the apron and through a table. So she's not even in the match and she's getting thrown through tables. But uh, eventually the power trip, they grab Roy Johnson and throw him through a table that's set up in the corner. So that's one. But then the shirt lifters fight back and they hit a 3D on Travis, Travis Banks through a table because you got to throw a 3D on a tables match. So Travis Banks is, goes through a table. So now it's 1-1. One, one. So the next person that goes through a table loses. Jack Sexsmith pulls out Mr. Kako out of his ass, puts the condom on his hand, puts it in the mouth of TK Cooper and TK taps out. But it is a tables match. And that is not how you win this. This whole hullabaloo and distraction allows Travis Banks to come from behind. Oh, yeah. Jack Sexsmith power bombs him through the table that's set up in the ring. And uh, the South Pacific power trip win the match and they get their second win of the month. So just more solidifying of this team. Pretty entertaining match. You know, Jack Sexsmith and Roy Johnson, they're. Look, the, the whole thing is that they want to be more than comic relief, but they do offer that. They offer levity throughout these shows. They're very entertaining guys. So, and I thought they looked good in this match as well. So, just a more healthy tag division. It's a common theme here. And uh, well, that's what we got there. But hey, while we're talking about titles, while we are talking about titles, Let's talk about the women's championship, the one that's not not existing at this point, but we're building towards crowning the first ever progress champion um, through the natural progression series, which is a round robin, not a round robin, is a single elimination tournament. And uh, the winner becomes the first women's champion in progress. And we get the first first round match of this tournament 
in a match that I probably would have guessed would have been the finals, but it is not. It is a first round match. We got Pollyanna versus Jenny. So we talked about these two before. They had a pretty heated rivalry in Endeavor, which is uh, like progress. It's basically the NXT to progress. It's like the lower level shows. But they had also the first uh, women's match on a proper chapter. So they had, like, I think it was a street fight at the Super Strong Style 16 about a year before this. So a lot of history here. Jenny, I mean, I've gushed about Jenny a lot on this. She just feels like such a star. She feels like seven levels levels above everybody that I've seen in progress from, from the women's side. She just comes, she has like this natural charisma about her. You see a lot of women and men too, but just like in this in this context, like there are women out there. It's like you could tell they're forced. They're forcing the facial expressions. They're forcing the voice inflections. They're forcing. The, it's like a forced charisma. And I'm not gonna name any names, Mercedes Monet, but there's some women out there that force it, and it's not natural. Ginny. It's all natural. It just feels so natural. Crowd, she has crazy heat with the crowd, and she can follow up in the ring. So she is a star. I don't know who's the first women's champion here, but Ginny would be my guess just based on the momentum she has. You know, I was talking earlier how I'm watching OTT and Ref Pro and other British promotions, and Ginny's popping up everywhere. She's in very high demand, and she would eventually go to WWE. And I'm surprised she didn't have a more substantial run there, honestly. But so Jenny's here. Pollyanna's also here. She's like the number one women's baby face at this point. Um, in this match, I don't know what it was. She felt a bit off. Like she came out and she like looked a bit disheveled. I don't know. I don't know if there's any more to the story or what, but like there's a lot of mistimings in this match. A lot of like, you know, like Pollyanna would go for like a running knee in the corner, but wouldn't really land the knee there was kicks that looked awkward there was counters that looked awkward i mean it was a fine match but it definitely felt a bit off for whatever reason um and i also i didn't love the finish i'll say that i did i did not love the finish i love who won i did not like how this match kind of but i guess that's kind of the nature of this because pollyanna and jenny have had a pretty heated rivalry i mean they had a street fight at chapter 19 i believe it was that was pretty brutal. So it's like, how do you follow that up? Like, you can't just have a regular wrestling match. So they went a little heavy on, like, the the finisher kickouts towards the end. Like, I mean, they, they go back and forth throughout the, the first, like, I don't know, 60, 70 percent of this match. Uh, Pollyanna hits a apron DDT on a Jenny, which Jenny took that like she got spiked like a nail into wood. Um, brutal looking. Polly rolls her in the ring, hits the pollinator which is like a, a, a angel's wings or a pedigree face buster, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but which is her finisher, but she doesn't go for the pin. Uh, Ginny eventually gets up to her knees, gives her the middle finger, which th that Ginny's selling here was also a bit suspect, but so it was kind of off on both sides here. Uh, Polly hits her with a cradle shock for a two count. So it's like, okay, you hit her with your finisher and then another move that spiked her on her head for a two count. OK, fine. But Jenny fights back, hits a, a top rope face buster for a two count, picks her back up. Jenny hits her with a style clash for a two count. So we're throwing out our finishers here, top rope finishers, and that's not getting the job done. But Polly fights back. Hits the uh, I call it a dude buster because <laughs> that's what I, it's, it's like the pile. It's what Trent Beretta does. It's what he used to call it in WWE, I think. It's like uh, it's kind of like Hangman's Deadeye too, where it's like a pile driver, but they're they're behind you and you lock their legs in, and then you jump to your knees and drive them on the mat. So Polly does this to Ginny, hits her with one, maintains the control of her legs, gets back up, hits a second dude buster, gets back up, goes for a third one. But Ginny miraculously <laughs> recovers and rolls her up to counter and gets the one, two, three out of nowhere. So Ginny wins. She moves on in the tournament, which I'm all about. But yeah, I didn't like you get dropped on your head like that many times in a row and you can just whip out a roll up. And I don't know. 
it was a bit silly. The commentary is really pouring on that. You know, they say Ginny didn't win. Pollyanna lost. So I don't know, you know, what story we're building there. Um, I don't know. Is this just the vitriol that Pollyanna had for Ginny? Like, I don't know. I didn't really understand the. Uh, like emotionally, why would she? Do? I don't know, but maybe 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 it'll make sense in the future, but it was just weird to me, but it was a fine match, but it's good to get, finally get this tournament started for the women's championship. So that was fun. But uh, before we get to the main event, before we get to the Progress World title and the craziness, I mean, we got one of the biggest matches <laughs> in Progress history and a really bizarre ending here. Just want to give a few other shout outs to some stuff that happened this month. For one, we had a dandy little high flying match and don't skip. Look, I know. <laughs> I know here in 2024. This is kind of why I wanted to even bring this up at all. In 2024, with AEW and that style, and even WWE to an, an extent, high flying wrestling has almost become kind of like, I don't know, there's just kind of a disdain that's grown for it. And I think there's still value in it. I think you can still do it very well to a point where it works in a wrestling context. Like, I get it. There's a lot of no selling out there, there's a lot of contrived spots. A lot of wrestling matches feel very Cirque du Soleil rather than an actual struggle. But when you have a guy like Mark Andrews and a guy like Matt Cross facing each other, which we do here in night two, they're fighting to be uh, the number one contender for the Smash Wrestling title, which, you know, whatever. Mark Haskins is a champion. That's it's cool. There's some stakes to it, whatever. But I really wanted to bring this match up because... This was a quality over quantity high flying match. This was a I, whatever you want to call it, high flying cruiserweight, whatever you want to call it. This was a cruiserweight match done very well because here I'll, I'll start from the ending. We'll do a little uh, we'll do a little uh, Benjamin Button. We'll do a little. Uh, that's not the right reference. We'll go from we'll start at the, the end and we'll work our way back just to kind of highlight this because the ending stretch of this match, if you would, if you watch it, it's so hype. The crowd is on their feet. They're throwing their babies in the air. They're spitting in each other's mouths. Like they are so hyped for this. And in, in reality, we see kind of sequences like this a lot and to not a lot of reaction. So the ending stretch of this match, Matt Cross, Versus Mark Andrews, which, but first of all, just two of the most underrated guys going. So Mark Andrews, he goes for a reverse Frankensteiner off the top rope, does it, but Matt Cross lands on his feet. Crowd is like they they just seen aliens land. Everyone's on their feet. Matt Cross is hulking up. Mark Andrews is bewildered. Matt Cross. Huge pump kick that turns Mark Andrews inside out. Go, Matt Cross goes to the top, goes for the shooting star press. Mark Andrews gets his knees up, rolls them up. One, two, kick out. So we're getting these false finishes everywhere, and the crowd's super into it. And then Matt Cross is able to fight back and hits a springboard cutter. But not like a, not not an os cutter, not like not like the cutter everybody's doing nowadays. He does like I think Kofi Kingston was the first guy that I saw do this. But it's when you go head first or like back of the neck first into the top rope, springboard back, hit a cutter. It's kind of silly, but it worked in this scenario, and that gives Matt Cross the win. So which is very surprising because Mark Andrews is like the he's like a, a pillar quote unquote of progress and um but yeah matt cross comes in beats mark andrews in a very good match but that was the end of this match and the way and the way they built up to the finish is why the finish was so good because it wasn't just dive 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 i mean this is probably like i don't know a 15 minute match or so but it's not there weren't a ton of dives in this match i mean it kind of starts off hot when they're like Mark Andrews goes for a suicide dive on the outside, hits it. And Matt Cross, you know, he reverses something on the outside, gets back in the ring, hits his own suicide. And then Mark Andrews hits like a flipping helo over the top. And then Matt Cross does a Sasuke special 
you know, handspring moonsault over the top rope. So they kind of build off of each move to where it ramps up into a crescendo. And then the match kind of slows down for like, you know, the middle period of it. And even when they do do like high spots, they all make sense. Like, for example, Mark Andrews, you know, he sets Matt Cross up on the top rope and he's going for like a Frankensteiner or something. But Matt Cross, he like he fights out because he doesn't want to get hit with this move. So he's not going to just sit there and let him set up for the thing. So Matt Cross puts Mark Andrews on his shoulders and eventually hits a Death Valley driver off the second rope. But the whole time Mark Andrews is you know, elbowing, he's scratching and clawing, he's trying to get out. So it's like all of these things make sense while they are kind of um, like it's, it's, it's a spectacle, of course. And um, no one's going to claim this is like a shoot fight or anything. But it's just the overall selling and the uh, the urgency, the unwillingness to take moves. I, I was just very impressed by this match. So I just want to shout out Matt Cross, Mark Andrews. I will, I will gush over these guys all day, every day. But yeah, Matt Cross gets the win. So I guess we'll see him and uh, Mark Haskins face off at some point. I don't know. I mean, it's a smash wrestling, so that might not occur in progress, but we'll see. We'll see. Um, on the other, <laughs> on the other end of the spectrum, one last thing before the world title scene, uh, we got the continuation of Sebastian versus Pastor William Ever. So to catch you up in case you are uh, unfamiliar with this feud, or if you just forgot, um, so Sebastian is kind of just a, I don't know, he's just a cunt, like picture a cunt in your head. That's Sebastian. Like he just he just looks like it. Uh, kind of like kind of like a, he was like he was like in a frat, but he had to like pay extra. He he like his dad knew somebody to get him in the frat, and then he like brags about it to all everybody else, and he gets like <sighs> frappuccinos at Starbucks. Like it's like that kind of guy, you know. So that's Sebastian. Pastor William Ever is like a cult favorite of progress. He looks like Jesus. He's a pastor. It's a whole thing. But the crowd gets really into it with all the chants and, you know, all that stuff. Right. Like I said, he's a cult favorite pastor. And they're both uh, basically trained in house from progress. So they're both pretty new in the business and they're both kind of still in the learning process. But they're two guys that have, are kind of getting the spotlight here in the main shows. And they had a really bizarre segment a few chapters ago where because Sebastian cost Pastor the world championship, which, by the way, Pastor William Ever was recently the progress champion. Sebastian cost him the match. The next chapter, Sebastian, basically his rationale was like, what, you know, we both started at the same place. Why are you? Why? Why, why am I so bright? Jesus Christ. The, I'm talking about Pastor William Ever and the, the clouds open. Good golly, Miss Molly. How I am. That's as dark as we're going to get. Um, but yeah, so Sebastian's like, you know, we're, we're, we both started at the same place. Why is progress putting you up? Why are they giving you this spotlight? Not me. So he's a jealous piece of shit. And then pastor is just like, oh, you know, he doesn't say much, but he's Jesus. Um, so it's kind of a weird. The crowd didn't really know how to react to it. And uh, they were supposed to have a match at Brixton, the last chapter. And apparently they did, although it was not included on, uh, you know, what I was able to watch. It's not on demand or anything. Um, I guess the match got started and Pastor hit Sebastian with a lariat that legitimately knocked him out. So that they had to call the match um, pretty much right away and it didn't really get underway. So that was kind of paused for this for for that second. Um, but now here now we're at chapter thirty eight. First of all, we have a match between Paul Robinson and Pastor William Ever. Paul Robinson, for those who aren't familiar, he's bald. He's 140 pounds. He looks like Dobby. He spits in people's mouths. He's a rat. He's a rat. He's a bald little asshole, as he's been described on this show. Um, they have a fine match. It's whatever. Paul Robinson beats Pastor William Ever with a curb stomp. Um, but as Pastor is laid out in the middle of the ring, Sebastian's music hits. Now, remember, Sebastian had been injured at the previous chapter. Sebastian comes out in a neck brace, comes to the ring, gets in the ring, takes his neck brace off, throws it at Pastor, and Sebastian says, 
you see this? This is what you could have done. And then he's yelling at Jim Smallman and all the owners of progress that are ringside. He's like, why is this guy booked? He's a, he's a menace to society. He's dangerous. Why is he on this card? He could have fucking killed me at that last show. We we're going to continue to book him. So he's going off on all this shit. Um, and Sebastian essentially threatens to press charges against Jesus. Unless Jesus becomes his slave, which this all feels very sketchy to me. <laughs> but um, So that's basically where we're at. You know, Pastor, he doesn't really say anything. He seems very, um, he seems like he has remorse. He seems like he feels sorry for Sebastian in a way, but he also feels like you're kind of being a dick. But ultimately, Sebastian says he's going to call his lawyer if Pastor doesn't do what he says. So now I guess... Sebastian has a new pet in Pastor William Evers. So I guess we're continuing this story. We'll see how it plays out. But um, it's just a very bizarre story. I don't know if I like it. We'll see what the payoff is. But yeah, so that was that was kind of the mo one of the most story heavy segments, honestly, on this entire month. But just wanted to uh, keep you abreast of the Sebastian and Pastor William Evers storyline. But hey. Why don't we wrap this bad boy up with a little progress championship? Huh? So night one, which we'll touch on. Um, actually, you know, before, before we even get to the title of matches. Night one, we had a progress world title number one contendership four way match, which may have been the match of the month. Either this or the triple threat world title match, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But this was. I mean, and correct, look, so we got Marty Skrull versus Joe Coffey versus Pete Dunn versus Trent Seven. And yes, Pete Dunn and Trent Seven are also the tag team champions. So, of course, they there's a lot in this match where they're working together and all that stuff. Um, but I was watching this match. My, my main takeaway, it felt like a very it was very tight, you know, like, like some four way or like any multi man match. It can be a little bit uh, clunky. It can be a cluster. It can be kind of contrived. Things don't really feel super smooth and like one move, you know, one spot to the other with multiple guys at play. Like it, it, it can end up being very, like I said, clunky. Um, but this match was not that. It felt very tight. It felt it, it felt like four guys legitimately trying to win a match, which I feel like is such a it's it's, it's such a challenge. In a four-way match or any multi-person match, so uh, that was major props to this one for these guys putting on this match. There was a lot of you know some some banter in there, but the most of this match was very um, it was intense and it was good. Um, I mean, there was a lot. It was damn near impossible <laughs> to take notes on this match, but I'm just gonna you know rattle off some of the notes I took. Uh, most importantly, here I think it's the debut of Pete Dunn's furry jacket, so that's exciting. Uh, I could be wrong on that, but we're, we're, you know, continuing the evolution into full bruiserweight mode. Basically, he's coming closer and closer to what he is today. So it's that was probably honestly the biggest, not really, not the jacket it, itself, but Pete Dunn in this match. This is like his first foray in the world title picture. I guess the same thing for Joe Coffey and Trent Seven. But I know Pete Dunn becomes a major fixture in the world title scene at some point. So it was very interesting to see him. Um, I mean, he was getting huge reactions in this match from the crowd. He felt like a star. And because he's been just like a tag team guy, preliminary guy so far. So it's like, at what point does he just kind of ramp up and do they strap the rocket to this guy? Because he's at this point in time, he's Pete Dunn's dom He's winning championships in WXW. He was the OTT champion. He's your Rev, Rev Pro champion. So it's like he's here in progress. At what point does that success kind of translate to progress wrestling? And I think I think this is probably the first big step in doing that. So it's so all four guys in the ring. Once again, Marty Skrull, Joe Coffey, Pete Dunn, Trent Seven. Marty, before the bell even starts, sprints across the ring, running punt to the balls of Joe Coffey, which I respect, which I respect. Um, he's throwing out super kicks and like I said, it, it's a lot of chaos in this match, but it, it felt very organic as it was happening. Marty Skrull and Joe Coffey get knocked to the outside and Trent Seven tries to lay down for Pete Dunn for Pete Dunn to get the win. 
because remember they're tag team champions they're boys i don't know why trent is just i don't know why trent doesn't want to win the world title <laughs> you know what i mean like why is i guess they had maybe they did rock paper scissors backstage and pete done one but um but both guys come in to break it up they stop the tag team shenanigans I will say, though, there was, a, there was a decent amount of, you know, British Strong style, which is Trent Seven and Pete Dunne. There was a decent amount of double teams from those two, but they felt very embedded in the match to, to a point where it was never like, you know, it's not like those two were just like dominating, like for throughout the whole match, like methodically and slowly. It was just like every once in a while they would come together and hit a double team like a like that dragon suplex European uppercut combo. And like there was one point where <laughs> Trent seven does a spinning back fist and Pete Dunn has an enziguri, but they hit it on Joe coffee at the same time, which like sounds kind of mundane, but looking at it was fucking impressive as hell. Like the timing of that Marty Skrull throwing out a double chicken wing <laughs> onto British strong style, which is very impressive. Uh, Joe Coffey, speaking of impressive, he gets his impressive spot when he gets all three guys on his shoulders at once. Yeah, like, like for an attitude, like, you know, like a smoke and drop type of position. All three guys on his shoulders. Now, he isn't able to really hit anything. They all fight off eventually, but the fact that he was able to get him up there and walk a few steps was crazy. That's a strong bloke, this Joe Coffey. Uh, we get some double finger bites, double finger snaps. Uh, Joe Coffey hits his discus lariat on a Trent seven, but Marty sneaks from behind and locks in the chicken wing on Joe Coffey for the tap out. So Marty Skrull ends up winning a fantastic, a fantastic four way between these guys. I thought uh, Joe Coffey looked really good. Yeah, he was the one baby face in this match, so he had plenty of time to shine. He looked really good. Trent looked really good. Marty Skrull, is, he felt like the, the bona fide main eventer in this match because he had just lost uh, the Progress World title. So obviously he fit in there, but he, he felt like kind of the foundation of this match. Um, but like I said, I think Pete Dunn was probably the highlight just because this felt like his coming out party as a singles guy. And the crowd was really reacting to him. There, <laughs> there was a this is Peter chant because you know this is progress is the thing that they always chant but uh this is peter is just it was good stuff but yeah the crowd just felt like they're really reacting to him and he felt like a star out there in this first match where he's you know adjacently challenging for the world title so um so good stuff there from all guys after the match marty marty Skrull grabs the mic and he's going off on, you know, how progress is where it's at because of him and how Marty is going to become the first ever three time progress champion. He says that he's the greatest progress champion of all time, which prompts AFI to hit the to hit the uh, speakers. Jimmy Havoc's music plays who Jimmy Havoc who was just, I mean, he was, he's the guy that really put the rocket on progress, dominated chapters 10 through 20, got a knee injury, recently returned. He returned to the last chapter by uh, costing Marty the match. And here is Jimmy Havoc once again. His music plays, but nobody's coming out. So I'm like, okay, Marty's doing the old, I'm going to play the music and then make fun of the fans for react. I thought, all right, whatever. Like, I even stopped paying attention a little bit. It's like, okay, nothing's happening. But then Jimmy Havoc comes through the crowd, hops the barricade, gets in the ring behind Marty so Marty doesn't see him, spins him around and hits him with an acid rainmaker lariat. And Jimmy Havoc, Jimmy Havoc leaves Marty Skrull Lane and then ski daddles. So, so where we're at. So Marty has just won the number one contendership for the progress title. Jimmy Havoc is back and we're obviously building to a match between Jimmy and Marty. I'm looking at this. I'm like, God damn, Jimmy Havoc versus Marty Skrull feels like such a huge match. And this is not something that I would have ever thought um, had I not watched progress from the beginning. You know what I mean? Like Jimmy Havoc had a cup of coffee in AEW and I never was really into him. Never really felt like a star. But it just goes to show like the way you book people 
and wrestling promotions. Like you can book anybody, right? Um, but it takes somebody with a lot of talent to make it work and make it work long term. I think it's just a testament to um, one, how well the company has booked Jimmy Havoc, but also Jimmy's execution of his booking, his promos, his character work, his in ring. So it was very interesting just to, how how big of a match Marty versus Jimmy feels in my cockles um, from watching this. I thought it was very interesting. It just all feels super organic and. You know, it just shows if you book something right, you can make anything feel like a big deal. So and like I said, in, a, in AEW, I didn't really care a lot about Jimmy Havoc. But here, 2016, this dude feels like an absolute superstar. Marty, same thing, dominating everywhere in Europe at this point. So can't wait till that match happens. Oh, wait, it's next night two. Um, well, kind of it kind of happens. So we have um, actually, you know what? We're going to wait. Not yet. Oh, hold on. Hold on. Keep that chastity belt on. We're not ready yet because night one, Mark Haskins defends the progress championship against Zach Gibson. Cool to see Zach Gibson get the spot. It seems like his kind of his position. It's like when, when uh, Will Ospreay won the world title here, Zach Gibson was his first defense. So he kind of feels like a gatekeeper, which I feel like he's, he's just capable of so much more, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to get mad at him getting a main event slot here. So Mark Haskins, Zach Gibson, of course, Zach comes out. Everybody's throwing that they're littering the, the ring with, Toilet paper. They're, they do not like the Zach Gibson fella. But the match eventually gets underway. And uh, I mean, it was just a good match. I mean, there was nothing super flashy about this match. I thought the just the unique transitions and counters between these two guys, because both guys are very proficient and submission offense. Zach Gibson kind of has that William Regal, Nigel McGuinness kind of hybrid style where it's a lot of just kind of, you know, it's gritty, but there's also some fluidity to all of his submissions and all the ways he can grab you and make you squeal. And what? Um, and Mark Haskins, he's just very like kind of Brian Danielson esque in a way, but a little bit more high flying, a little more striking. Um, but I just, I thought these two guys and their styles meshed uh, very well. Like I said, very good match. Haskins with this hot start with all of his high spots. He does like the suicide dive. He does like a reverse 619, gets back in the ring and then does a suicide dive to the adjacent side of the ring. Um, all the springboard drop kicks, but then Gibson slows it down, works the arm. Um, does a lot of that, a lot of unique submissions. Haskins eventually fights back, hits a suicide dive on the outside, and Zach Gibson comes back with a suicide dive. Again, everybody's just doing suicide dives this month. Zach Gibson hits him with a spinning tombstone for a two count. Mark Haskins goes for his rolling. He, he'll, like, run at a guy, trap their feet with his feet, and then roll into a sharpshooter, which is how he won the title. He goes for that, but Zach Gibson has it, has it scouted, shoves him face down in the mat and fucks him in the ass. No, he did locks him the shankly gates, grabs the arm. Just a really like brutal, gritty uh, counter into the shankly gates, which is like an arm bar submission. Um, but Haskins eventually fights out of it and rolls him up into a schoolboy, but then seamlessly like just gets right into the sharpshooter. Like he rolls him up but with his legs already intertwined with Zach's legs and he just gets right into the sharpshooter. It was just so slick. And um, so Haskins locks in the sharpshooter and Zach Gibson has to tap out. So good match, good match. But that all sets up night two. We're here, folks. We are here. The night two main event for the Progress World title. It is a three way match. Mark Haskins defending the title against Marty Skrull and Jimmy Havoc. So remember, Marty, Marty won the number one contendership match. So you would think it would just be a singles match between Marty and Mark. But I guess according to commentary, Haskins wanted Jimmy Havoc involved in this match because, you know, Marty and Jimmy, they had been fighting about who was the best progress champion of all time. And of course, the current champion, Mark Haskins, 
feels disrespected by this. So he wants to beat them both in the same match to kind of to put that to bed, to uh, quell the disrespect, I guess. But I'm looking at this. I'm, I'm wondering, honestly, if this maybe was supposed to be the main event of Brixton, because I mean, this I'm looking at this. I mean, this has got to be the biggest match that has ever happened in progress history at this point, just based on the star power, like from how people have been booked in progress, like Jimmy Havoc, probably the number one guy in progress history at this point. Marty's probably number two. You could probably throw Will Ospreay in there. And Mark Haskins is the guy that just organically got over and is red hot at this point. So it's like, why wouldn't this be the main event of your biggest show? And it was pretty close. Like the main event of Brixton was Mark Haskins versus Marty Skrull versus Tommy N. I'm wondering if Tommy was like a last minute, like maybe Jimmy wasn't clear to compete and they thought he might be. I don't know. This is all speculation, but all that to say, this match is fucking huge. And um, it almost feels a little rushed, maybe. I mean, I don't know. Maybe you have the match. Why not have the match? I get it. But it's just like, man, it's kind of just came out of nowhere a little bit. Um, it seems like a match that you would build to. But again, it maybe just the nature of independent wrestling. You know, it's you got a month in between shows sometimes. So I get it. I get it to an extent. But that being said, all of that being said. Fucking fantastic match. Again, there's, there's a lot of chaos here. I can't, you know, <laughs> say for a fact that I took notes on every single spot that happened in this match, but it was just a really, really good three way here. This is a uh, Havoc's return match. Like I mentioned, he's recently coming off an injury, so he hasn't had a match here in probably like a year or so, I would guess. Uh, at least crazy, crazy baby face reaction for Jimmy Havoc, which is just so wild. He was the most hated heel I've pretty much have ever seen uh, just a few years ago. And now it just has completely flipped. It just goes to show the respect this crowd has uh, for Jimmy Havoc. I mean, like I said, he was carrying the progress torch for so long. So Havoc's here. Crowd's hot for him. Crowd hates Marty Skrull seemingly just as much. Um, Marty sprints to the ring because, you know, remember Jimmy the previous night or the previous couple weeks or whatever, the previous show, uh, Jimmy had laid out Marty's girl. So Marty sprints to the ring. Him and Jimmy start going at it before Mark Haskins even comes to the ring. Um, but then Haskins comes out, runs to the ring himself, hits a suicide dive onto both guys. The energy right here from the from the gate, from the word go was just it was just crazy like the crowd was so into this this feels like a top level main event like a whatever progress is version of wrestlemania main event like this feels like it right here jimmy introduces some chairs not a ton of plunder in this match which i guess is technically no dq but um most of this was just straight up wrestling just with a few uh chair stuff like uh you know jimmy hits everybody with chairs and there's chairs set up in the corner and there's one spot in this match where Jimmy sets up a chair table on the outside. So he has like four set up chairs so that there's like a, you know, a platform of steel right there. Sets it up on the outside. I guess to superplex Marty off the top rope through this. But Jimmy eventually gets um, knocked through these chairs himself, which looks pretty gnarly. Uh, what else? Again, this is another just chaotic match. It's like one of these matches that's impossible to take notes on. Haskins and Havoc take turns because, you know, Havoc and Marty are going at it. But Mark takes out Jimmy to go up for Marty and because they both want to kick Marty's ass. I don't know. Um, lots of compound spots from all three guys. Like when, when I say compound spots, I mean, like, you know, uh, like Havoc hits a GTS on a Mark Haskins. But then Marty Skrull gets in there with an umbrella shot to havoc and like it's just like one move leads to the other one guy's out of the picture but then he slides in there it all felt very seamless and um similar to the four-way it just felt very smooth this match I was, I was a big fan of it jimmy havoc at one point hits a double rainmaker which i don't even totally know how that was possible but um very impressive stuff there then the ending stretch here is a lot happening I made sure to, to note everything that happened because it was there was so much going on, but I, I thought it was a cool finish. 
So Mark Haskins locks in his bridging arm bar, which is how he's won a lot of matches. He locks in this arm bar onto uh, Marty Skrull. Marty counters this arm bar into a chicken wing. Mark Haskins counters this into a rolling sharpshooter. Jimmy Havoc slides in, goes for a rainmaker on a Mark Haskins, but Haskins ducks, locks Havoc into the rolling sharpshooter. But Havoc fights out before he can lock it in and counters it into a Rainmaker. But then Marty pulls Havoc off of the pin into a chicken wing. But then <laughs> Havoc rolls through for a two count. Up, oh, Havoc goes for the Rainmaker on a Marty Skrull. Skrull blocks with a European uppercut. Marty hits Jimmy Havoc with a low blow, which takes Havoc out of the picture. Mark Haskins back in. Rolling sharpshooter to Marty Skrull, and Marty taps out. So among all of this chaos, among all of this star power, Mark Haskins, the champion, successfully defends his title. Um, like it's just an awesome match. It felt a thousand miles an hour, but uh, I thought it really solidified Mark Haskins as a top guy here, because like I said, Marty and Jimmy are like the, some of the top two guys you know, from a, from a perception perspective of the fan, like they're the top two guys in this company's history. Mark Haskins is on his way here, but I think this match did a lot to solidify that. So you think it's going to be a happy ending. You think it's like, okay, Haskins wins. He's the champion. What's next for the new champion? But after the match, you know, Haskins, whatever he celebrates, he goes to the back, everybody leaves. Jim Smallman, the ring announcer, the owner, he's like thanking everybody for coming out. Thank you. Drive home safe. But Mark Haskins comes back out. No music or anything. He just comes back out with his championship belt. Gets in the ring. Well, he's, he's holding his championship belt. He gets in the middle of the ring. He's standing on the progress logo in the middle of the ring. Squats down, looks at his title for a, a couple seconds. Puts the title on his head. He he's, feels like he's thinking about something. Kisses the championship belt. And then places the belt in the middle of the ring. And then walks away. What? <laughs> what are we doing? It was a very... I mean, the crowd's chanting, what the fuck? Crowd's like, what are you doing? Jim Smallman grabs the belt. He chases Haskins. Or he's like, what are you doing? Hey, mate, you lost your, you, you forgot your belt, mate. Oh, jo Jolly Roger, you forgot your belt or whatever they say. Um, so it seems like Haskins is relinquishing the title, which I'm not sure why, because he doesn't seem injured. <laughs> he doesn't unless they did. I could cut like a fucking five second test back. I don't know. I'm very I'll say this. I'm very interested to see where we go. I mean, I'm very interested to see why he gave up the title seemingly. I'm very interested to see, you know, what shakes out of like, are we crowning a new champion? Like what happens there? So very bizarre ending, but it piqued my intrigue. So I guess that's what you want. It made me look forward to the next show. And that's really all you can ask for. So, but with that, I think that about covers it, right? October 2016 of Progress Wrestling. It's a very interesting month. Very, a lot of new faces, a lot of new developments. Some big time matches and uh, some weird storyline <laughs> pivots. So, um, but again, I'm still I'm very interested to see the next show. And it's still uh, British wrestling, man. Say what you want about it. There's a lot of shitheads involved and there's a lot of hullabaloo involved. But at this point, man, mid late 2010s, it is rocking and rolling. So I'm excited to keep on going with this. And um, damn, I, I encourage you guys to check out progress. Demand Progress, I believe it's called. What is it? Yeah, Demand Progress Plus is the streaming service for Progress Wrestling. You, you can watch all this stuff for eight, eight pounds a month, whatever that is. So for like eight dollars a month, you get all of this stuff. And uh, to me, man, it's worth it. I mean, if you want a, a really solid alternative out there and you want to see some of the best I mean, you want to see like the ground um, kind of like the launching point for a lot of stars today. A lot of guys and gals you may not know and 
just a really fun company to watch. So I definitely, I would strongly uh, recommend this, of course. I mean, I've been covering progress for a couple of years now, and uh, I just don't get tired of it, baby. So do that. And uh, while you're just doing stuff, make sure to follow me on all the social media. Join the Discord. All this stuff is in the description below. And I appreciate you guys tuning in. Appreciate you guys uh, jumping across the pond and uh, putting on your uh, your beef eater hat and uh, watching or listening to me or watching me uh, gallivant about the progress. So with that, I'll love you. I'll leave you. Appreciate you guys once again. I love you all. Big old smooches all around. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm hard. It's a hard it's Talk around and disregard it. Ship you off the ground, show you what hard it is. Standing strong and proud of me, and I guess let's get it started. It's the hardest. It's talk around and disregard it. Ship you off the ground, show you what hard it is. Standing strong and proud of me, and I guess let's get it started.